A while ago, a friend of mine sent me a link to an interview between Michael Burry and Bloomberg. Michael Burry is a famous hedge fund manager who made quite a bit of money shorting the real estate market right before the 2008 financial crisis. He's even depicted in The Big Short by Christian Bale. And in this interview, he came out with a new staggering bet, that index funds were in a bubble. Index funds are a popular passive investment used by many beginner investors to gain exposure to the markets. The S&P 500 ETF and index fund has got to be one of the most popular investment vehicles ever. And yet, in this interview, Michael Burry argued that because these funds are seeing so many inflows from active and passive investors alike, it's obscuring price discovery. In other words, people are simply buying the stocks that underlie these indices because they're included in the index and not because of fundamental research. Therefore, the price of these stocks aren't reflecting their intrinsic value. Michael Burry even went as far as to say that there are parallels between index funds and CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, the investment that helped fuel the 2008 meltdown. So my friend's question to me was, is this plausible? Could index funds and ETFs truly be in a bubble? And my answer to that is maybe, but this isn't actually a new argument. This is something that's been discussed quite a bit within the investment community. And there are plenty of other investors who have come out with this claim, but I'm always skeptical when I hear it because it essentially argues that passive investing is causing problems. And that's a little too convenient for active investors to argue because obviously they want to prove that passive investing doesn't work so that you'll go with them. And don't get me wrong, I'm an active investor. If it turns out that index funds and passive investing doesn't work, that's great for me. But I've never had gripes against passive investing. I think anything that it helps empower people to invest is great. And index funds have done wonders on that front. If it turns out that there's a problem with index funds, of course we want to explore that. But I am always skeptical when I hear active investors touting that we're in such a bad situation that there's a bubble. Not to mention that there's a lot of misconceptions with the argument here. Firstly, index funds don't own half the US stock market. There are plenty of news headlines that argue that, like this one from CNBC, which reads, passive investing automatically tracking indexes now controls nearly half the US stock market. But that's not true. Yes, it's true that passive funds have seen massive inflows and active funds have seen outflows in the US. And for the first time ever, it does seem like passive funds have more assets under management than active funds in the United States. But they don't own half the stock market. Funds only represent a segment of the stock market. And in terms of how much they own of the whole stock market, it's a lot smaller. In fact, according to a 2018 paper by the Bank of International Settlements, passive index funds only hold roughly 15% of the US stock market. And that's not to mention that the United States has a higher than average utilization of passive funds. In Canada, for example, according to Morningstar, active funds have seen three times higher inflows than passive funds. So it goes to show that this problem is a lot smaller than it's been painted. Secondly, the term index fund has been broadly used to reference both index mutual funds and ETFs. And not all ETFs are passive. You know, the Bank of International Settlements does argue that only roughly 2% of ETFs don't track an index of some sort. So 2% of ETFs could be argued as active, but it does show that there is a small segment of that market that isn't truly passive, which is kind of being tossed into there. Thirdly, and this is something that a lot of people brought up, CDOs are a lot different from index funds. They are similar in the regard that, you know, CDOs hold a portfolio of mortgages while index funds hold a portfolio of stocks. But CDOs also did this kind of restructuring of cash flows and obscured the risk profile of the underlying mortgages. They were being filled with worse and worse credit mortgages, but the CDO product was being labeled as AAA safety, whereas ETFs don't do that same restructuring. So there is quite a fundamental difference between the two. But in Michael Burry's defense, I don't know if he was necessarily arguing about the structure of the two, but rather what's happening with them. With CDOs, what happened was there was a lot of investor demand for this product, and that drove demand for the underlying mortgages rather than housing purchases. In other words, there was kind of this vacuum being created where investors wanted more mortgages than they existed. And that kind of led to banks being more aggressive in their lending practices, leading to riskier and riskier mortgages filling these CDOs. And you could argue that ETFs could see a similar thing. With a lot of demand for the ETF product, you could see underlying demand for the stocks increase. So I do see his point there. And also, strangely enough, he actually referenced synthetic CDOs, not the true CDO that most people are familiar with. Synthetic CDOs are like CDOs, but they don't hold any mortgages. They only hold derivatives. And I'll touch more on that later and why it might actually be a valid concern with ETFs. But for the most part, the main point being that 
CDOs are quite a bit different from index funds. But finally, a last point of clarification here. While index funds do represent a sizable 15% of the US stock market, they only represent roughly 5% of daily trading volumes, meaning they probably have a muted impact on price discovery. There's actually a great video by Ben Felix from Common Sense Investing, who we've worked with before on this channel, about the index fund bubble and how it doesn't matter how much assets you have under management, but how much you're trading, right? It's the buys and sells of a stock that change its price, not the assets being held by passive and active funds. And because these passive funds aren't trading as much as active funds, only 5% of daily volumes, they might not necessarily have as much of an impact as we think. Now, the reason why the volume is so low for passive funds is that A, it's just part of the strategy because they're buy and hold funds. But the second reason is that at least on the ETF side of things, a lot of ETF trades don't directly impact the underlying securities because a lot of ETF trades are done between ETF holders. They aren't trading the underlying securities and the underlying securities are typically only traded when the authorized participant, the person who's managing the, the ETF, when they redeem or create more units. So when they destroy or make new units of this fund. And that's rarely done on a daily basis. That's only typically done when there's excess demand or not enough demand for this ETF. So because you have this buy and hold strategy being done by these index funds, and because on the ETF side of things, you don't actually have a lot of trading of the underlying directly, then you might not necessarily have a price discovery problem. So even before jumping into the problem itself and just by clearing up the facts around it, you can see that the problem is likely a lot smaller than it's been painted to be. And even if passive investing did represent more of the market, John Bogle, who effectively created the first index fund, argued in the past that we would still have sufficient price discovery even if passive investing represented 90% of the market. So there's not necessarily a bubble being created by index funds at this time. Though I do hesitate to say there's not a problem. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to fear monger here and I think it's kind of silly to make these tall claims about index funds and the next bubble because black swan events are very hard to discover beforehand. But at the same time, there are a lot of unknowns and uncertainties around these issues. And when I look at these data points, a lot of questions do come to mind. Firstly, while only 5% of daily trading volumes are directly tied to index funds, I don't know if that's representative of the impact indices have on all trading in the market. We have things like closet indexers, which are mutual funds and other asset managers who mimic a market while claiming to be active. They effectively hold a lot of what the index holds because they don't want to deviate too much and risk being way off from their benchmark. And the problem with that is that even though they're being classified as active traders, they are effectively being passive. And while the practice of closet indexing is certainly discouraged within the investment community, it does still happen. In fact, there's a 2016 paper done by Kremers et al. Kremers, yeah, A-L, at all. This is a 2016 report in which they argue that within countries, the share of closet indexing is roughly equal to the explicit indexing practices. So by rough extrapolation, you could argue that with 5% of the trading being actual indexing, another 5% might be closet indexing. So that impact is a bit bigger there. And even outside of closet indexers, there are a lot of ways in which indices might affect active trades. For example, there's a well-known phenomenon known as the S&P effect, whereby companies that are included in the S&P 500 automatically see their price increase. It might not be a permanent price increase, but it does show that prices might increase when included in an index without any fundamental change to that company because passive investors buy it up when it's included. And secondly, that stock becomes more visible to active traders. Even the argument we made about ETFs not affecting the underlying prices of its assets might not necessarily pan out because of something known as arbitrage. This is something that was highlighted in the BIS report as an area that needs further research. But effectively, what it means is that there are active trades that might be affecting the underlying assets of an ETF. What happens in theory is that when an ETF price inflates more than it should be, more than what the value of its holdings are, then the authorized participant will create more units, trade the underlying to adjust, and that will be recorded as a passive trade. But what might actually happen before the authorized participant does that is that active traders might buy the underlying securities and do an arbitrage trade, effectively selling the ETF unit and buying the underlying assets, and that will close that gap. But in the process, the active trades are inflating the underlying securities. Now, the second reason why I hesitate to say there isn't a problem is what Michael Burry says about liquidity. These ETFs and these index funds are causing a lot more demand for stocks than these stocks can individually handle. For example, he goes through an index and he finds a lot of companies that are trading less than a million dollars a day with hundreds of billions of dollars tied to them. 
He even goes on to tie derivatives into the equation to show that there might be a problem if we see a sell-off in the area. A quote from the interview is, potentially making it worse will be the impossibility of unwinding the derivatives and naked buy-sell strategies used to help so many of these funds pseudo-match flows and prices each and every day. This fundamental concept is the same one that resulted in the market meltdowns in 2008. And I think this is what Michael Burry was talking about when he mentioned synthetic CDOs. Synthetic CDOs didn't hold any mortgages, but they still had a huge impact on mortgage prices because people were effectively betting on the side about the price of those mortgages. And there are some ETFs that have a similar structure. For example, things like leveraged ETFs. If you ever see an S&P 500 two times levered ETF, that is probably using derivatives. Now, according to Vanguard, synthetic ETFs, so ETFs that use derivatives, only make up 2.9% of ETF assets in North America. But in Europe, where they're a lot more popular, they make up 35% of ETF assets. And the problem there, the tricky thing, is that those European ETFs can mimic United States stocks. So even though they're in Europe, they could still be influencing the underlying prices of the assets. If we saw a downturn where people were rushing out of stocks and ETFs, not only would we have a situation where authorized participants are redeeming units and applying huge selling pressure to the underlying stocks, but we would also have these derivatives trying to unwind and deliver on the assets they promised. And that would just apply even more sell pressure on these lightly traded stocks. So in my eyes, that's the real concern here. It's not that there's too much demand for index funds and that passive investing is ruining stock markets, but it's that we don't fully understand what will happen when we have authorized participants redeeming units, when we have these derivatives unwinding, if there's a downturn where stocks and ATFs are being sold. But admittedly, it's very hard to quantify that risk. And it's by no means a basis for claiming that there's a bubble coming or that we're currently in a bubble. And at the end of the day, a lot of investors make claims about bubbles that never materialize. Steve Eisman is another investor who shorted the housing market, who's also pictured alongside Michael Burry in the big short, but he's been calling for people to short Canadian banks since 2013. And that call has largely not led to anything. It's not to say he's not a smart man and that, you know, there's some validity to the concerns he raises, but it goes to show that bubbles are very hard to predict. It's almost as if economics and finance are very complicated fields and nothing is black and white. Who'd have thought? So while there may be reasons for concern within the index fund industry, I'm very skeptical of the tall claims that we're currently in an index fund bubble. But with all that being said, Michael Burry is a very intelligent man, certainly more intelligent than myself. You know, he's a doctor, I'm a YouTuber. I work in investments, but you get my point. So while I am skeptical of the claim, I will be keeping my eyes open to see what happens with the index fund industry. Thank you very much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please let me know, like the video, share, all that good stuff. If you have any topics you want me to cover in a future rant video or a lesson video like I typically do, leave a comment down below. And if you have any thoughts on the topic at hand, I'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks for joining me today and as always, be safe out there.